Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark, and on behalf of the entire team here at the Maine State Chamber of Commerce, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2024 update from the commissioners. Thank you for joining us. We would like to begin by thanking our sponsors, and they are our 2024 webinar series sponsors are AARP, Central Maine Power, Delta Dental, Canvex Savings Bank, and Sun Life Insurance. Our supporting sponsor this morning is AmeriHealth Caritas. And our premier sponsor this morning is Hammond Lumber. We are pleased to share a message from Hammond Lumber with you. Hammond Lumber Company is a fourth generation family owned and operated business. Founded in 1953, Hammond Lumber has steadily grown into Maine's largest independent lumber and building material supplier. We want to thank you for supporting our Maine family business this past year and every year. We feel privileged to have again served the needs of our Maine communities across our 21 locations statewide. The Hammond team is made up of 800 dedicated employees. When you're ready to tackle your next building project, no matter how big or small, depend on Hammond Lumber Company for the products and services you need. Whether you're a contractor, homeowner, or do-it-yourselfer, Hammond Lumber will see your project through from start to finish. The knowledgeable staff at Hammond Lumber will be with you every step of the way and keep your project on schedule. From free estimating and planning, to design and drafting services, and a wide variety of building and remodeling products, including complete home and garage packages. Hammond Lumber, the 2020 Pro Sales Dealer of the Year, is proud to be your building project partner. From our main business to yours, we wish you success and good health as we move through the new year. Learn more at HammondLumber.com or stop by the Hammond location nearest you. Thank you from everyone at Hammond Lumber Company, proud to be one of the best places to work in Maine. There are a few things we'd like to share with you about this morning's session. This meeting is being recorded and the recording will be made available on our website in the next few days. We brought you all in on mute to reduce the background noise, but you do have the capability to unmute yourself. We ask that you please hold any questions that you may have to the end of the presentations. At that point, please click raise your hand or type your question in the chat box. Please make sure your chat is addressed to everyone. We will use the chat function to share links or any other useful materials. And if you lose your connection, please rejoin us using the same link. It is now my pleasure to introduce the President and CEO of the Maine State Chamber of Commerce, Patrick Woodcock. Good morning, Patrick. Well, thank you, Mark, and thank you all for joining us this morning. My name is Patrick Woodcock uh, with the Maine State Chamber of Commerce. It's wonderful to start the morning off with the familiar jingle of ham and lumber. I won't recite the, the familiar tunes as well, but on this crisp Maine morning to have a full roster of Maine's commissioners from the Mills administration. I will be brief in, in my uh, introductions, given the the number of commissioners that we have, I will just say that um, from my experience, these are the individuals that uh, clearly have the uh, understanding of the priorities of their department, but they're also seeing trends in their policy with interactions with their colleagues across the states and uh, really have the pulse of what in 2024 will be the dynamics at their department. Uh, couldn't be more pleased that they've all uh, agreed to to join us uh, this morning. We are starting with uh, the Department of Education with Commissioner Macon. Um, we'll be providing about 10 minutes for each commissioner. I'll come back on screen uh, about a minute uh, prior to that duration uh, to remind uh, everybody about the timing. And we'll start to interrupt you with about 30 seconds just to, to keep us on task. Uh, Commissioner Macon has an extensive uh, professional background in Maine education, uh, principal of the year. We couldn't be more pleased that she's able to serve in this capacity given uh, that background. And I will turn to Commissioner Macon. Commissioner. Thank you so much, Patrick. And thanks everybody for being here. Um, 
I'll I'll make remarks uh, briefly because I know that there's a large slate of 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 speakers, but I also I'm not sure if there is a Q and A opportunity, and I'm happy to address areas that might be of interest that I don't hit upon. Uh, but my update would be, in general, there uh, the challenges. I'll start there, and then I will talk about the solutions that we have underway and any of the results that I, I think might be of interest to you. Uh, there's a nationwide crisis, as you likely know, in attendance and engagement nationwide, mental health and behavioral health, educator workforce, and school safety, to name a few really key areas. Um, and I want to remind you, so, um, and that would include the school safety piece. People immediately go to preparedness for a crisis event, and that is really important. But it also speaks to a, a need um, to address socioeconomic disadvantage and uh, punitive disciplinary practices in schools and school climate and culture in general, as well as being extremely well prepared for emergencies, uh, learning how to prevent those and then how to respond in the moment. Through the federal relief funding that we've been able to provide statewide, um, we've had allocations of hundreds of millions of dollars across the state to schools for their efforts related to learning loss and um, other emergency necessities in the wake of the COVID pandemic. What we have also been able to do is start up a few statewide initiatives that we're really hopeful. We're seeing great results thus far and um, there's more good to come here. So I'll review a few of those priority areas. Um, we, first of all, to focus our emergency relief efforts in all of the funding that we've been receiving from the federal government we pulled together focus groups of parents and students and educators and school leaders, legislators, the business community, um, higher ed partners, and our student cabinet representing every county in the state. Um, a whole student approach was a resounding theme. We uh, heard that people want students in our schools to be safe and healthy. They want them to be engaged, highly challenged, but also heavily supported and prepared to join the workforce and for college career um, opportunities after high school. Um, in a, so, so with respect to our school safety, starting there, we um, initiated a school safety specialist training and credential. And thus far statewide, there are 96 school safety specialists who have gone through this training representing 72 of our districts. Those districts who don't yet have a school safety specialist, though, were likely attending one of our many statewide uh, trainings for schools who every year have to develop and revise a school emergency preparedness and response plan. And that work has um, been heavily supported by our school safety center that was established four years ago. We've also done a statewide effort Call, it's called BAR schools. You might have heard about these because we have about 100, I think, right now in the state of Maine. BAR stands for Building Assets, Reducing Risks. In part, the philosophy underlying this approach to education um, is it's an interesting and hopeful, I think, counter to what we've heard for years. And ACEs, the, the Adverse Childhood Experiences, those are still very important. And certainly trauma in childhood um, does impact a person for their entire lifetimes. However, there's emerging research to show that positive childhood experiences can have a mitigating effect on a student um, who has also experienced trauma. And, and so um, the BAR model helps a school, any school, elementary, middle level, or high school, to redesign the way in which they do their work. It's a really comprehensive, remake of scheduling, teaming, creating small schools within larger schools, grouping students in heterogeneous ways, um, training educators in looking for signs of academic, you know, potential academic um, failure or uh, you know, failure to thrive, 
but also to be watching for those other indicators that are behavioral, social, emotional, engagement related um, metrics that educators are given the tools, the training and the time to pay attention to and to design interventions or to refer students um, to others in the school community who can make those kinds of, of changes. So um, we, we started the Bar School Initiative in this current school year that we're in, although there were 20 schools across the state prior to this. They, in fact, were the ones who convinced us to really try to uh, pro propagate more Bar Schools. The, sc the Bar Schools that are in existence, 15 or 20 of them, in some cases have been around for 15 years. And we're really proud to say that when we offered an opportunity during the hardest times really faced by public education for schools to completely reimagine what they do, we thought we would get four sign up for this, honestly. We had 72 new bar schools, um, people saying, yeah, we're, we're in. Um, early results, they just started in September. And the early results are showing that fewer students, significantly fewer students um, failed a class, for example, in their freshman year, which one failing in one quarter of a class can set a student on a trajectory toward dropping out of school eventually. So it has already demonstrated um, a dramatic reduction in failed courses for students and a dramatic increase in attendance in the schools that are implementing this. These are just early results. Um, this model also is recognized uh, by the federal uh, bureau that's in charge of substance use um, prevention. It's it's a uh, an evidence-based model for substance use prevention, which is also deeply needed. So, it, and, it, and they just received back uh, data from a study with empirical evidence that bar school educators are more likely to persist in their jobs and to be satisfied with their working conditions. So it's addressing multiple um, areas of concern for us. Um, in addition to that, we have also um, been working on, we, were, we partnered with Live and Work in Maine. We've developed a Teach Maine overall plan that does everything from uh, providing greatly enhanced support for anyone who's interested in joining the education workforce to navigate through um, you know, the criteria, the uh, certification process. We've set up a statewide job board so that there is one central place where people can go to look for a job in education in our state. And there was also a recent um, national advertising campaign where in some cities along the Eastern seaboard, the subway doors would part open and there'd be a big you know poster of you know come teach in Maine and showing our showing showcasing the great aspects of our state um, those advertisements have been out for a couple of months uh, tops and already I guess there have been more than 22 million digital engagements where people are clicking on um, links related to education in Maine while they're in the vicinity of you know a bus that just passed by with that advertising um, on there. Uh, also, there have been 65,000 engagements over the past couple of months in the online job board, the statewide job board, and 1,700 new applications for positions in Maine from folks who live outside of the state of Maine. So we're, we're proud to see that that is um, something that's already showing remarkable success. Um, also, in the past calendar year, we had more new educators receive certification than in the year prior to COVID, which is also remarkable considering the national trends that are so much worse. You might hear this and think, I live in a community where they can't staff the schools. They don't have enough people. And there, there are many, unfortunately, places across the state that are not able to staff up properly. Um, but it's an extremely uneven situation. There are many schools that are well-staffed and Unfortunately, that is a byproduct of our the, the fact that we do have local control and that local communities determine, you know, how much they uh, will invest and pay. And those disparities do create um, exacerbated challenges for communities that don't have the ability to be competitive in their wages. So that is, that is a continued um, challenge. 
Um, let's see. Commissioner, also... just to, sorry to interrupt, just, just if you could wrap it up in about 30 seconds, sorry. Oh my gosh, yes. We have computer science mobile labs in every school in the state of Maine, 90%. They all are invited to have these. Um, these were part of the governor's emergency relief. And we have trained over 200 educators in design thinking to create innovative programs. Those have all been funded. Many of them have um, received national recognition, including in St. George, the first in the nation, CTE pathway for pre-K all the way through high school. And they've received a recent $500,000 award and those are just a few examples thank you so much and i had no idea that that was it was so much time thank you so much commissioner um it is such a challenging moment after the pandemic we so appreciate what you are attempting to accomplish from absenteeism and bringing in a workforce i don't usually get teared up reading the press herald but the story about uh, uh bringing uh students to their buses um, to try to address it. it, it's a the aggregate statistics are so staggering, but there are moments of intervention that are are really starting to see some success, um, and really appreciate all the efforts from the Department of Education. We are going to do um, some questions. We have some time at the end if you're able to continue with us, um, but we are trying to make sure we get through the full roster of commissioners. So I, I do apologize that it is tight. Um, the, uh, the next commissioner is uh, Commissioner Johnson, who I've had the opportunity to work with perhaps the most extensively since since I began with uh, a background in technology, leading Connect Maine Authority, or hailing from Skowhegan, which I am dying to see with her. Um, <laughs> commissioner Johnson has uh, been leading the department through uh, the economic development plan and through the post-pandemic recovery. We couldn't be more pleased for her leadership at, in the administration with the business community. Commissioner Johnson. Great, thanks Patrick. And uh, it's good to it's good to see all of you remotely this morning. I will try to cede some of my time. I know you all hear a lot from me, so I will, um, and, and you have some opportunities for some, some other commissioners today. So I will try to cede some of my time, but Patrick, you are welcome in Skowhegan as are all of you. Um, welcome in Skowhegan anytime. There's a lot of interesting work going on in Central Maine right now. Um, and so certainly something that that as an administration we want to highlight and as a local, I love to highlight as well. Um, Skowhegan certainly leads us into a little bit of storm management discussion. Um, I know there there's a lot of um, work that needs to happen if you look at both the, the river flooding storm in December and the recent coastal storms, obviously a really significant amount of damage um, to community infrastructure, to individual businesses and to homes. And so there's a lot of work that we need to do there um, collectively to help people rebuild and recover. Um, you've seen emergency declaration work um, and a number of other pieces. FEMA and the federal administration is generally the, the initiator of, of is the primary funder of a lot of this rebuilding and recovery work. Um, but obviously the administration is also looking at options and trying to work with partners to figure out how to, how we help um, rebuild. I would say a big lens on that isn't just rebuilding what was there. It's really looking at as we rebuild, how do we think about long-term resiliency uh, so that we don't have to have this discussion again in five years um, for the same infrastructure, you know, thinking about, um, climate resiliency, thinking about what does it take um, to build things back in a way that makes them more stable long term. So I would say a big body of work going on there in partnership with the main emergency management team, um, the marine resources folks and others. Um, so more to come there, I would say uh, a lot more to come there, a lot more work to be done. I also just wanted to touch quickly as well in the strategic plan. Patrick referenced it um, Thank you to all of you who have been involved uh, as we have gone through the first phase, done a lot of implementation, would say we've made some pretty significant progress, but there's a lot more work to be done. And so what, what you will see coming up is the refresh. And so the goals stay the same, the strategic themes stay the same, um, but with you all and I don't know, hundreds of other people across the state, basically we tried to take up the data and say, here's what the data tells us. Now, what do people around the state, how do you interpret that data? 
um, what do we think are the are the top priorities in each of these suites now so that we have kind of a new and refreshed roadmap to continue to work together against. Um, so that will be out in February. Um, again, thank you all that have contributed. And I would say it's a working document. We're going to release a new doc, a formal document in February, but um, it is a living, breathing document. We need to make adjustments um, as we go. And so certainly very happy to do a lot of that work as well. So kind of look for that. Um, what I will say that's came, that's come out of that is we had some really significant progress in workforce, but there's just so much more to do. Um, if you look at kind of credentials of value, the systems that are being built to do skill development in partnership with the private sector, I think we're seeing some models there. Um, we've been able to test and pilot some models in partnership with um, higher ed and, and the private sector. And some of those are showing results. And so I think there's a lot of interesting learnings there that we can continue to, to apply. Um, there's a partnership with DECD, Department of Education and Department of Labor around helping high school students get paid work experience. That will continue um, and go forward. But thousands of young people are now getting paid work experiences in Maine's businesses and communities and nonprofits so that they can start to build professional networks, start to build these critical thinking skills that we need for the workforce. And, and it also gives them a chance to see, like, is this, an, is this a body of work that I'm interested in? It's funny that they were not interested is almost as valuable as we are interested because then students can continue to, to focus um, their work. And then just finally, Derigo Business Incentive. Thank you all for your help getting that through the legislative session last year. Um, rulemaking, the rules are likely to be published next Wednesday. If they don't get out next Wednesday from the Secretary of, Secretary of State's office, they'll get out the following Wednesday. Um, and the comment period is a 30 day comment period from that. So please look for that way in. We'll try to push it out as well. Um, and then that will go live January 1st. So rulemaking is really important. I, rulemaking is super boring, but it is really important in this case because it helps us define these sectors a little bit. So I think it's work that you all will care a lot about and it certainly impacts our ability to attract um, companies to Maine and, and to allow all of you to expand. So thank you, Patrick. Well, thank you, Commissioner. It feels like we've had a number of body blows uh, to the main economy with the storms, the river flooding, and it's an interesting aspect that you note about quickly restoring infrastructure, but being thoughtful about it, and really look forward to partnering with you and the administration to try to create a regulatory and permitting process that enables both. Um, thank you so much for your leadership under the last few months and for your tenure at uh, DECD. I'm uh, going to turn to uh, a former colleague of mine, uh, Commissioner Head, um, which is who leads perhaps the uh, department that Mainers should be more familiar with, but it really is the lifeblood of professional licensure. Um, Commissioner Head has had a long tenure uh, at the Department of Professional and Financial Regulation. We've all seen her signature on elevator um, inspection notices. Um, but for those who have not met her, she has been meticulous through trying to ensure the balance of, of ensuring that the workforce is uh, well equipped to, to meet the challenges, but that it's also ensuring that uh, workers can enter into the workforce as quickly as possible. Uh, so nice to reconnect with you, Commissioner Head. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, I always hate to follow Commissioner Johnson because she speaks so so easily about what she does. Um, I want to say that DPFR is a different kind of department. We have five agencies, separate state agencies within the department. Three of those are financial services agencies. And by that, I mean they protect the public from financial harm in different ways. And we have two new leaders. Uh, Linda Conti was recently uh, appointed by the governor to lead uh, consumer credit protection. Uh, and as well, uh, Jesse uh, Devine is the new office uh, administrator of the Office of Security. He comes from a, a wonderful background in the area of cryptocurrency. And um, we, we are looking forward to um, his 
expertise in helping us understand cryptocurrency platforms and uh, how to protect the public from harm in that in that area. So uh, both leaders are looking to reorganize and reassess the focus of each agency, and they are doing a great job. The third financial uh, financial services agency is the Bureau of Financial Institutions, led by Liza Fountain. Um, <clears throat> The, as I, excuse me, as I indicated, cryptocurrency is not well understood. The platforms are confusing, and we are learning of scams already uh, from scammers who will contact a bank customer, indicate that there has been a hack in the account, and the customer should immediately transfer the funds into a cryptocurrency wallet. Well, in a matter of seconds, those funds are gone forever. So we are looking to these three agencies to work together to prepare information for the public and how to keep themselves safe from these scams. Um, it's, it's really uh, something that we have not experienced, you know, in a, in a lot of cases, but there's no question it's coming. Um, so that, that's uh, one thing about uh, the financial services agencies is that they do work collaboratively to make sure they are in concert with each other, those three particularly. Um, the fourth agency, the Bureau of Insurance, is the largest agency within the, the department and is uh, probably the most high profile of our agencies. Um, it is in the forefront of several high profile uh, issues, both in the health insurance and the property casualty area. As uh, Commissioner Johnson indicated, the recent storm damage across the state brought into focus the issue of flood insurance and the lack thereof. It is simply not within the reach of Mainers living near the coast and in other areas of Maine that have experienced uh, terrible damage. Uh, there is little the Insurance Bureau can do since this is a federal program, but the Bureau works with insurers, property insurers, to make sure we understand what their concerns are and how they can be useful to citizens uh, in Maine who are experiencing this, this terrible impact of climate change, basically. Um, so we encourage everyone who has been damaged to contact FEMA and work with FEMA to see if there are federal funds available for uh, rebuilding those areas. Uh, the Bureau is also concerned, as we all are, on the, the cost of long-term care insurance on the health insurance side. Um, it is something that was simply underestimated by insurers many, many years ago, and the premiums are now not sustainable for people that have paid them for many, many years. So uh, the Bureau has done a lot of work in uh, changing the rate structure so that those premium holders, the, the policy holders, at least have uh, some of the benefits that they signed up for, but at unfortunately a much higher cost. Um, so those, you know, the Bureau staff is currently working with the National Association of insurance commissioners on ways to make that more affordable. And on the property side, auto insurance seems to be tipping, ticking up a little, but we still enjoy some of the lowest rates in the nation on that score. So that's what the, there is sort of, that's just a segment of what the Bureau is working on. But I do want to cover the Office of uh, professional and occupational regulation. It, this is, has become uh, a focal point for uh, the governor's 10-year uh, plan. And we understand that uh, we need to be bringing more workers into Maine. We have worked on this for several years already, and um, we have implemented many different new pathways to licensure for people in other states who may have an interest in coming to Maine. So um, that's called license by endorsement. We have used that 
uh, frequently within the last couple of years since the law passed. And that, that is a very uh, useful tool for people that don't have to go back and redo anything in their credentials. They simply, we simply look at the home state's license requirements. If they are similar to Maine, we issue the license. That has been very helpful. Um, the other thing that we're working on is uh, what we call uh, interstate licensing compacts. Those are very popular in most states right now, but we're all looking for the same people. Each state is trying to draw people into their workforce. So uh, we, the legislature has agreed that these are ideas that, that should be uh, developed and we are doing that to make sure some of the um, most needed professions are involved in those contacts so that we can get help from other state licensees to use telehealth in Maine on the, um, on the health side uh, and to bring new Mainers into our licensing category. That is a long-term effort that we are uh, committed to doing. And, um, you know, I can't say enough about these agencies that staff is really working hard to maintain what we have and to move into the future. So I'll stop right there. And um, I guess I'll, if there are any questions, I'll be here at the end to answer those. Thank you very much, Patrick. Well, thank you, Commissioner Head. I'm starting to assess in my head who has the most challenging role um, of all the commissioners. We're all making a, a persuasive case for that ranking. Thank you, Commissioner, for all you're doing uh, with some dynamics on the insurance market. That's an, a topic that we'll be covering at our leadership summit um, in a few weeks. Uh, I did want to turn to uh, Major General Farnham, who uh, we have with us for uh, a couple more months, is my understanding. Uh, for those who have not met him, he has been leading um, uh, in his role since 2016. Um, and has been a bedrock of the of the Bangor community. Um, he's been leading the Department of Defense, Veterans, and Emergency Management since 2016, uh, a graduate of the Air Force Academy. Um, and we want to, uh, the Maine State Chamber of Commerce wants to uh, signal our appreciation for your service over these years. Major General Farnham. Thank, thank you, Patrick. Uh, I do... Uh... I want to say uh, you're uh, only a couple of weeks, not a couple of months that I have left, uh, but I'll I'll talk about that briefly at the at the end. And uh, I tell you, I knew I had made the big time, made the big leagues when uh, the first time I got in the elevator and saw Ian's signature. And I said, I know that person. So uh, so I uh, I appreciate the elevator comment. I think that's what we all know Ian the best for, even though that's probably the least of her efforts. Um, I just got to quickly most people recognize that they from my role as being the uh, adjutant general and having the air and army guard but the rest of it in the department is the uh, bureau of veteran services main emergency management and my role as a governor's advisor on homeland security um this morning i'm actually sitting in pete rogers office over at mima um as we're having the uh, state homeland security conference is going on right now so when i'm done i i will have to go back go back to that um I'll start with MEMA. Um, I, I don't think I have to say much about what's been going on at MEMA. They've been extremely, uh, extremely busy. You know, you, usually we go a couple of years between declared disasters, federally declared disasters. Um, right now, there are nine open declared disasters. And uh, the December storm uh, it was officially requested yesterday as declared waiting on the president's signature. But that'll be our 10th actually open disaster. Followed by these two storms in January that we're waiting to find out if the uh, the FEMA is going to allow us to make it uh, one event or two events, but that could be eleven and and twelve open, you know, open declared disasters. So obviously they've been very busy, and you know we talk a lot about preparedness and and individual preparedness, uh, but uh, a big part of what they do ends up being after the fact in the recovery and and the damage assessments and working with FEMA to uh, to make sure that the state gets the federal. Uh, resources that uh, that we need uh, to do that recovery. So uh, a lot of busy people here. 
Um, Bureau of Veteran Services is, uh, you know, primarily the job that they, they have is to connect Maine's veterans, which we have over 100,000 Maine veterans, uh, but to connect those veterans with the resources um, that are out there and also run for Maine veteran cemeteries. The, you know, there are th hundreds of organizations across the state that uh, are there to help uh, to help veterans and, of course, the VA. So a lot of that takes uh, a lot. Nobody knows all those are, that are available. So our main bureau uh, helps connect the veterans. Um, you know, last year they did had over 2,200 claims that they help veterans file, mostly with the VA, and then a thousand burials at our veteran cemeteries. So they, you know, stay pretty uh, pretty darn busy. Uh, Army National Guard, 1,700 soldiers. Uh, about two thirds of them are part time, a third of them are full time, and on the air side, 1,100. Uh, about 1,100 airmen, and uh, about 40% are full time, and 60% are part time. Still incredibly busy uh, across the state and uh, across the world. Actually, we had 188 soldiers and airmen that were deployed, that were deployed over Christmas this year uh, for you know anywhere from 30 days to a year deployments. The uh, and they're spread all over CENTCOM. You know they're in the Pacific, they're in Europe and then the southwest border and then doing cyber uh, activities in in uh, in the for the federal uh, for the federal response uh three quick messages along those lines that i just want to leave you with today first on emergency management you hear a lot about preparedness um you know the meme of folks go on and put out a lot of information about individual preparedness but uh i just uh want to talk briefly and just as a business just remind businesses that uh, preparedness and resiliency is more than just what the government does and, and more than the, the building back. A lot of it is how you structure yourself uh, for continuing operations. And I tell you, there's nothing that's more important uh, to our recovery as a state and as a community than businesses being able to get back up on their feet and being able to serve their customers. So um, one of the things that I like to use as an example is a lot of many you don't even remember it. So I may be dating myself just a little bit, but back during the Y2K thing, I can remember um, when I'm in my other life, I used to package ice and sell it to uh, supermarkets, for instance. And I remember Shaw's requirement for a Y2K plan in order to be able to sell ice to Shaw's. It was a, uh, you know, it was a significant effort to put together a Y2K plan to prove that on January 1st of 2000, that, uh, that we were gonna be able to produce and deliver deliver ice. And I remember trying to go for that year, go for a line of credit, uh, line of credit extension at the bank and the bank required a Y2K plan. Um, and as we face uh, future, uh, you know, everybody's expecting the storms and some of the future uh, issues uh, along these lines, uh, you know, having that continued continuity of uh, operations plan uh, is important, not just for your employees, but for, uh, for the communities in the state as a whole. Um, the other thing is uh, a lot of you employ veterans and I want to uh, thank you for doing that. I hope you understand what uh, hiring veterans does for uh, does for you, uh, but it's a tr tremendous thing. There's nothing better for a veteran, uh, especially a veteran that's struggling a little bit than to have a job. Uh, so that is very much appreciated. The other thing I just want to remind you as employers is that when you do have a veteran employee and they are struggling in any way, hook them up with Maine Bureau of Veterans Services and they can help them connect them to those resources or help them navigate the VA like we talked about earlier. Um, you know, th that's something a lot of people don't, they don't believe that they're, they're eligible for benefits. They don't understand what benefits they're eligible for. So if you've got somebody struggling a little bit, point them at, you know, help them out a little bit and just point them to Bureau of Veterans Services and they can help them out. Um, you know, a lot of you also employ our guardsmen, and we cannot do what we do in uh, in the National Guard without. It's our business model is to have the part time soldier and airman. So thank you very much for uh, employ uh, employing those veterans. And you know the deployments and how busy that we are is not going to change and not going to stop. But uh, and our our veterans are proud of what they do for the state and proud of what they do for the country. Uh, but it can be a tough balance. Uh, one of the you know it's uh, one of the comments that I like to. Uh, I like to when I'm well, you know, we call it a three legged stool. You know, you get your family, you've got your employer and you've got your uh, commander in the military. And if not, if all of them aren't equally upset with you, then you're not doing the job right. 
So it, it can be a tough balance. So I appreciate uh, I appreciate those of you that uh, do employ our guardsmen. And then as we've talked about a little bit, I do want the final update is that on February 2nd, uh, I will be leaving this position uh, that I've had for about eight years. It's been it's been an incredible honor. I work with great people. Um, and, uh, you know, the other commissioners that you're hearing from today, incredible team. I've enjoyed immensely working with them. But I'll be replaced by somebody that's uh, incredibly capable. Uh, Diane Dunn um, is a uh, former assistant adjutant general on the Army side. She spent the last couple of years working up at the University of Maine as a special assistant and a chief of staff uh, to uh, President Freeney Mundy. Um, you know, when you see her resume, you'll see that she's uh, much more prepared for the job than I ever was when I came in eight years ago. Uh, and I'm really excited. Uh, I'm really excited about what she'll bring to the table. Um, so, uh, so again, I appreciate I appreciate the time. I've always appreciated the uh, the uh, the work with the main chamber, uh, the advice of uh, pre pre uh, Patrick uh, Dana Connors. Uh, he convinced me that it was uh, I, it you could decide to retire in your sixties. It's not easy, but uh, so it's in in his case, it's do as I say, not as I do. But uh, but again, appreciate your time today. Thank you. Well, uh, Major General Farnham, we, we couldn't be um, more pleased with your leadership. Maine is lucky to have you in your role uh, during these times of uh, disaster and insecurity globally, uh, but moreover to inspire uh, an, another generation of leadership. We're, we're so pleased and it sounds as though we'll, you'll be uh, working hard for your remaining couple of weeks and uh, really looking forward to, to working with your successor. Thank, thank you so much for your, your leadership. Um, did want to, to turn to uh, Commissioner Fortman. Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Fortman is doing uh, her second round as Commissioner of the Department of Labor at a time where the Dep Department is undertaking, as, as everybody knows from the Maine State Chamber of Commerce, one of the most significant rulemakings in, in decades with the paid family medical leave. She has been extremely accessible to uh, the chamber, uh, both her staff, uh, and we've developed a quick rapport. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Commissioner Foreman. Thank you, Patrick. And I was going to talk about um, paid family leave at the very end and do a little bit about the department overall first. So I will get to paid family leave because that is, I know, the number one topic for most folks. But before jumping into that, I did want to um, say that uh, you've heard all of my colleagues talk about the need for workforce. And um, the Department of Labor works with every single one of the commissioners who spoke um, before I did on that important issue. Um, it, you know, all of you know, right now we have a 3% unemployment rate. Um, jobs are now, uh, we've recovered from the pandemic. Uh, during the pandemic, I had spoken with many of you and the concern then was a, a focus on unemployment and how do we provide temporary benefits to folks while they're unemployed. Right now we have roughly uh, 9,700 more jobs than we had before the pandemic. And those are positions that are filled. Uh, so um, frequently people say, what about those help wanted signs? And it's not that we do not have people back in the workforce, it is that we now have more jobs than we had pre-pandemic, as well as the fact of the, um, the demographics. Currently we have more people over the age of 55 than we have under 55. So we're seeing we're seeing a growing economy um, and we're seeing a real need for uh, workers. And so the way that we're focusing on it is kind of um, in uh, three ways. One is an overall strategy. You've heard Commissioner Johnson talk about the 10-year economic plan and that there's going to be a refresh. One of the things about this administration that I want to stress is every single commissioner on um, in the cabinet works in a collaborative way and stays focused on some of those overarching goals that we all share. And making sure that we have a skilled workforce is one of those overarching goals. 
four years ago when the plan, the economic plan was first released, we at the Department of Labor wanted to make sure that we were in alignment with that plan. This time around, we want to be more than in alignment. Um, we want that plan to drive our uh, strategies. And so many of those listening sessions that were conducted across the state were conducted by both um, DECD and the State Workforce Board to make sure that it's um, truly, um, the strategies are truly integrated and that it's not just um, uh, lip service, but that there is a deep awareness of what where the state is headed economically. And then what are the workforce needs um, so, and the training programs that we need underneath those? So I'd say the first thing we're doing is really making sure that there, we have a plan and that we're um, collaborating on that plan. The next thing is to look at, OK, who is in the workforce today? And we're looking at that from, uh, again, kind of two ways. Who are the folks who have been left on the sidelines and what are the specific strategies that we need to engage folks um, to make sure that everyone who wants to work and is able to work has an opportunity to have a clear pathway. Uh, and when I say everyone, um, the Bureau of uh, Rehabilitation Services is also part of the Department of Labor. And one of those untapped labor pools that has been there, it's been a persistent challenge um, for many years, are folks with disabilities. Uh, people are talented. We have about 5,000 folks right now who have employment plans, who are actively looking for work. And um, we have very talented folks at our Bureau of Rehab Services who are uh, available to work with not only the clients that they're seeing, but also with employers and help make sure that it's a good fit. Some of the other populations that we have targeted strategies for are folks who are in recovery, um, folks who may have been in, involved with the justice system, people with limited English skills, uh, and uh, veterans. Every year we do a hire a vet campaign. We, um, in the fall, it usually kicks off right before Labor Day, um, but we, uh, our goal is to hire 100, 100 vets within 100 days. And this year there were over 200 veterans um, who were able to be hired. So I wanna echo what uh, the general said about, uh, you know making sure that veterans uh, have those opportunities and what great employees they are. The other thing that we've been doing is looking at what are some of the, the training models. We of course have strong working relationships with our um, community college system, with the university system, with other training providers, um, but uh, one of the um, models that hadn't received that much attention until recent years has been the apprenticeship program. Apprenticeship program requires an employer. We have to have, so it has that close relationship with employers. You have an employer who's a sponsor. There is a, an employee, an apprentice who is hired. It is a um, uh, training that is designed to meet the needs of not only the worker who will end up with a credential at the end of it, a portable credential, but also the employer. And we're seeing that um, our statistics across the board on apprenticeship is that there's a 90% retention rate. Right now, we have uh, roughly 130 registered sponsors and um, a little uh, about 13 hundred um, and fifty registered apprentices. We've expanded that program to a pre-apprenticeship program so that people can try it out. Um, you know, as you heard Commissioner Johnson say, sometimes you go into something, it might not be a good fit. That's a that's really good information for you to have. So pre-apprenticeship programs have been set up to give people an opportunity to try something out, especially young people and determine if that's a pathway that they want to pursue or not. Um, and we've targeted um, those folks who um, may have limited English proficiency or some other barriers. And um, Commissioner Head talked about uh, you know, changes in licensing. 
as well as looking at credentials that were um, earned elsewhere. Some of that can also be skills that were learned elsewhere. One of the things that we're seeing is with some of our new Mainers may have some skills in areas that we are really in need of, um, of workers, such as construction. Um, and one of the simple things that, uh, that we discovered when we were doing, um, and by we, I mean, we put out roughly $12 million in grants on apprenticeship programs and um, pre-apprenticeship programs. And so those programs are being run by folks who are in the industry. Um, and one of the things that was uh, a little bit of a barrier um, that we might not have realized is if, um, you know, the United States is one of the few countries that does measurement in inches and feet. And so something as simple as learning the metric system uh, can be a, uh, a, uh, a barrier, um, a small one, easily overcome. But those are the kinds of things that you can learn in a short-term pre-apprenticeship program. Try out some skills and see if you want to pursue that. Um, apprenticeship is not only for, um, for skilled trades. We've also uh, launched, in cooperation with the Department of Education, a teacher apprenticeship um, model. Some grants have just be re been released on that. And we're exploring uh, apprenticeships in healthcare as well. So it's a model that can work in any sector. We have a uh, partnership with the University of Maine and Augusta for cybersecurity apprenticeship programs. I just want to, um, to stress that this is a model that uh, you're earning while you're learning. It's employer directed and engaged uh, and there are great results. And in a time when we have very low unemployment, the unemployment rate is roughly 3% right now. And we're partnering um, with employers to try to help build training, retention uh, programs. Apprenticeship is a solid model. Um, I did want to shift to the, to the uh, issue that Patrick had raised at the very beginning of this, which is paid family and medical leave. Um, I think everyone uh, knows that the legislature passed a paid leave program uh, and it became the, um, the legislation has a, uh, a ramp up. So the law was effective in October of 2023, but laid out a uh, timeline for implementation. So 2024 um, is when we are doing rulemaking. And the first session um, uh, that we're holding is a listening session. We want to make sure that we're hearing from people before we put draft rules out. So the listening sessions are kicking off next week. January 25th will be the first session. And the focus of that session is on um, is going to be on contributions. We're getting questions about how is that going to work. We want to hear what your questions are around contributions. The second listening session, um, the notice just went out, I believe, today, and that will be for February. Um, and that listening, the topic of that listening session will be on um, eligibility. Again, we're holding listening sessions so that we can gather some of your questions and concerns so that when we actually get to the rule, um, uh, the drafting of the rules, we've already heard a lot of the information or questions that you have so that the rules can be better tailored to meet um, your uh, concerns. Yes, there is a link, and I'll make sure that we get that on into the chat. Um, the sessions are going to be limited to 500 people, um, but uh, and they will be recorded so that you will have an opportunity um, to hear those uh, if you're not in the first 500 people who sign up. And there will be multiple listening sessions on different topics. 
uh, before we start putting out the um, the draft rules. So 2024, focus on uh, draft rules and hiring uh, some a team of people here at the Department of Labor who will be working on it. Uh, right now, we have one staff person, and that is the deputy of that program, and that's Reggie Parson. Uh, we will uh, be bringing on a few more folks over the next coming uh, weeks to just focus on the rulemaking. Contributions will start in 2025, and then benefit payouts will begin in um, spring of 2026. So there is time. It, uh, I know we're getting lots of questions about very, very specific details for the, um, for the rule, and uh, we do not have those details yet. Um, sometimes in some cases we do because it's in the law, but there is also, uh, there are a number of questions that are being asked uh, that will have to be worked out in the rulemaking. And I see Patrick, you've got your hand up. <laughs> well, thank you. I hate to, to, to suspend the discussion on paid family medical leave, a, a hugely important topic and provokes a lot of questions, but we, we need to move to the next commissioner. I'll just say, we, we really appreciate the, your efforts for the listening sessions, the outreach with the business community. Obviously, a lot of, lot of interest in that to ensure that, it, that it's clear for businesses and do appreciate the experience you bring to the position uh, undertaking this rulemaking initiative. I know we'd have some questions um, if you do have the time to to remain on the call. If not, we'll be providing some feedback at the upcoming listening sessions, of course. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, uh, excuse me, I did want to turn to um, Executive Director John Rohde, work with the Workers' Comp Board, uh, an extensive background as well, um, going back decades with the Workers' Comp Board. Uh, and I'll turn to the Executive Director, John. Uh, thank you, Patrick, and uh, thank you, thank you for inviting me here this morning. So I have been with the board a very long time. I started back in 1993, and uh, what I want to talk about today, most importantly, is the progress that the current board of directors is making in meeting its original uh, intent. So, as many of you may know, some of you may not know, back in 1993, there were substantial revisions to the Workers' Compensation Act. And one of those changes was to create a labor management board. And the point of the board was to give labor and management, obviously, a seat at the table and an opportunity to address issues that arose uh, before uh, the agency. Over the years, the board struggled, especially in the early years, to reach any form of consensus. It was originally four labor members, four management members. In 2004, there was a significant change. The board was changed to three members from labor, three from management, and the executive director's uh, position. So my role is somewhat different than many other commissioners in that I have a board of directors with whom I work uh, to manage the sort of the policy end of, of the agency. And again, over what the original goal was for conversations, consensus, and so forth to be uh, developed. It has been difficult over the years, but over the last five years, we have been very fortunate to have a committed and engaged board of directors who have made substantial progress in uh, reaching consensus on issues, uh, developing a process, a format in which issues can be discussed, uh, thought through, and vetted before uh, decisions are made. And this is important because one thing I know I've heard many times over the years is folks value a stable workers' compensation system. And I think one of the best ways for us to provide a stable workers' compensation uh, system is to have a board of directors that is able, as it was intended to do, identify issues, discuss those issues, and come up with solutions that make sense for the system. One thing that's become sort of clear to the board over the past couple of years is developing a vision 
of what that means. Uh, back in 92 in the Blue Ribbon Commission report that kicked off the, the current uh, uh, act and structure of the agency, they gave two sort of general guidelines, substantial protection for injured workers at an affordable cost to employers. What the board is looking to do in, in 2024 and beyond, because it will be a fair amount of work, is to develop a framework to uh, understand what those concepts actually mean. It's easy to say we want substantial protections or adequate benefits for an employee. It's easy to say we want it to be an affordable cost. But when we start digging into it, we realize there's a lot of different places we can go. So uh, our board meets once a month uh, in person and by Zoom. So uh, attendance remotely is, is uh, available. In January, we started talking about what does it mean? What is an adequate benefit in our system? Um, we traditionally think of, well, you get two thirds of your lost wages. There are a number of states who've done studies to look at um, how that actually works. And that can be important, of course, because if uh, you know a solution or a problem arises, we want to make sure if we're addressing it, it's tailored to the issue that's before us. Uh, for our February meeting, the sort of general topics will be reasonable costs to employers, interstate comparisons, other things that have come up over the years. And again, the goal there will be to start the conversation and ultimately develop a better understanding or uh, of what the board thinks uh, those concepts mean. Where I think this will help is in, you know, in many past years, legislation comes up uh, and it comes to the board, the board discusses it, and each uh, proposal is sort of viewed in isolation. And that makes it more difficult, I think, for the board to uh, decide what to do with a bill. Is it a good bill? Is it a bad bill? Is it something worth pursuing? The whole, the goal for this year is to, again, develop that framework. So when issues are coming before us, we will already know if it's an area where we think the uh, system can be tweaked, where a uh, change might be necessary. If a change is necessary, how uh, should it be uh, styled so that it addresses the actual issue that's there? And to keep a balance uh, of, again, making sure benefits are adequate and the costs are reasonable. So if, and I've had these conversations with board members, I met with Jake uh, yesterday, Lachance, the agency should be able to explain if a benefit is something an injured worker desires, but the system doesn't provide, well, why is that the case? On the other hand, if changes are made or costs are uh, increased because a change is made, the board should be able to explain why that fits within the general framework of what we're trying to do uh, here at the agency. It will be a lot of work for the board of directors. Uh, they haven't Boards haven't in the past sort of dove into the, the underpinnings of, of the system and why we do what we do. We have had a lot of success. One measure of that success, I suppose, is the fact that I don't, workers' compensation doesn't make the news as much as it used to in past years. The board over the years developed a reputation for a place where gridlock occurred. We are moving beyond that. And uh, if you take one thing away uh, from my presentation today, I hope it is that, that the board has made substantial progress in reaching consensus. The labor members and the management members, they get along fantastically. They're able to uh, have conversations. And for the most part, for almost all issues, we do end up reaching consensus. One example I, I give is with our independent medical examiner program. And in that program, we have a list of doctors who will give an independent opinion as to whether an issue, is, uh, an injury is or isn't related uh, to work. There have been challenges with that program over the years, uh, and it, it has been seen as uh, an all or nothing on either side of the of the issue. The board had a situation come to its attention. There was a complaint about something in the independent medical examiner process. The important piece was the board of directors took the time to understand the issue, resolve that particular issue, but more importantly, came up with a 
process for managing the independent medical examiner system that is uh, much better than what it was. The board has more role and oversight in reviewing what's happening uh, and making sure that you know the goals of the system are, are being met. Um, so again, the hope is, as and the plan is, as we go through 24, uh, we'll start to flesh out some of these ideas about substantial protection, reasonable costs, and the like. And the most important thing, I think, in all of this, and it is, I think, a benefit to the system to have labor management at the table, because it is very important that we hear from everybody uh, in the system how it's working, where it's working well, where it's not working well, what we might be able to do to improve it, uh, where changes might need to be made. I think our system is a pretty good system overall. I don't think there are major problems with our system. That doesn't mean obviously there aren't things that can be done better uh, or different. Um, uh, but again, that's, that's our goal. I think, I'm sure, as we progress forward, what we will end up with is a system where um, there is more predictability and there will be less uh, swings of the pendulum, if you will, right, based on uh, changes uh, as a result of elections and so forth, something that has bedeviled the agency over the years. So I think I'm coming to the end. Uh, I, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to speak here this morning. Um, you know, we'll look forward to working with Jake uh, on issues that come before the board and whatever else, Patrick, you would like to send over there. Um, and uh, again, having those lines of communications open will be very, very important as we go forward uh, here at the board. Well, we so welcome you uh, joining us today. It seems, sounds like it's an interesting inflection point as you uh, undergo this exercise in reestablishing um, those definitions in the underlying statute and with the purpose of maintaining continuity going forward. And we will we will be an active participant in, in watching that and, and appreciate those objectives. I did want to turn now uh, to Commissioner Van Note, who uh, I had the opportunity to, to work with. I was so pleased to see when he uh, when he was uh, nominated. Uh, he uh, previously worked with the Maine Turnpike Authority, um, has extensive background in transportation, and uh, just brings a, a wealth of substance to the position. Uh, I had the, the opportunity of learning, of co-chairing, I think, the interagency review panel on looking at the Turnpike's uh, utilization of transmission in the property with him, which was a learning experience. But Commissioner Van Noe, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Well, thanks, Patrick. That experience is, we're still learning, right? We're still, we're still going to be talking about that. So um, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to try to, well, I always say I'm trying to be brief, but uh, I will stay within time. Um, this, this is a fortuitous day uh, to, to be here. Uh, this is you know, every January, I know everyone waits with bated breath. You know, January, you think of New Year's, you think of, you know, college football playoffs, you think of skiing and the unveiling of the main DOT work plan right up there with all those other things. That happens every year in January, and today's the day um, that it's being published. Um, so that will be the, uh, the bulk of uh, what I'm going to be highlighting today. Um it usually is anyway, because uh, you can talk in uh, theories and ideas and those kinds of things. But at the end of the day, I find that uh, policymakers and officials of all um, stripes want to know what are you what are you doing and where and when. And so this work plan, um, it, it, that's this year's um, lays out. Uh, it's a three-year work plan by calendar year. It's got almost 2,700 uh, work items in it, uh, and it totals $4.74 billion over the three years, or about $1.6 billion uh, on average per year. Um, it is the primary way we achieve our mission, um, which is to you know, provide a, a 
the safest and most reliable transportation system we can given available resources. Um, I think people who have, uh, you know, been forced to listen to me before, um, I usually talk about, uh, I, I was always kind of a tale of woe, you know, for years. In fact, uh, I didn't know I was going, so I'm, I'm known to be pretty straightforward. And once, uh, about four years ago, my uh, cover letter read, uh, the fiscal reality is that we are now competently managing a slow decline of our transportation system until bipartisan funding solutions materialize. And that's not exactly charge the hill excitement, but it was a sobering but real assessment at the time. And after that time, we had little things like a pandemic and a 50% increase in prices. So, type of, you know, the outlook was tough for transportation. But today I'm very happy to report that we have turned a corner. Um, we are pivoting from our old, what I call MacGyver mode, just holding things together um, or making do to making real progress. Um, that was made possible by some real bipartisan compromise on funding at both federal and state levels. Um, I think everyone has heard about the you know, bipartisan infrastructure law of November 21 on the federal level. Um, that was a uh, game changer for us, not because of the you know, overall increase in what we call formula funds or like paycheck funds, but because there were so many competitive grant programs that we could go after and we are uh, with, you know, thoughtful applications and the support of our congressional delegation. Um, the, the result will be that federal transportation funding coming to Maine uh, is roughly doubling from pre-bill levels to today. Um, that was a huge step forward. Uh, but the thorny issue of state capital funding for transportation remained. And I'm pleased to report that uh, last June, uh, another um, bipartisan compromise action happened that made the first structural changes to capital transportation funding in decades. I've been looking at highway fund budgets since uh, at least the 2000, uh, before that actually. Um, and this one uh, gave us a different, uh, more reliable funding. Uh, I think people have heard that um, the highway fund is obviously uh, in challenge uh, in general was because uh, its funding source, the per gallon gas tax, uh, wasn't keeping up with certainly buying power. Um, so two things, there were some uh, liquor proceeds that were uh, allocated to the highway fund, which take care of operational needs. In other words, keeping the doors open. Uh, but then uh, current law change was made in budgets uh, last year, where 40% of the automatic sales tax is now going. Um, to transportation, uh, and that's worth about a hundred million a year. Um, so that's that's real progress, and that's real good news. It doesn't solve the problem, of course, uh, but I, I I don't really want to focus on challenges right now. Um, our need was two hundred million dollars a year. We're still going to need one time stuff, uh, but this is a real pivot from making do to making progress. So what you'll hear about is this work plan of you know, four and three quarters billion. Um, it's the largest ever by dollar volume. It includes over the three years, 267 bridge projects, 285 million in uh, 285 miles of highway construction rehab. That is up huge. We were basically out of the construction business, um, the highway reconstruction business for a while. A uh, bunch of highway and spot improvements all over the state. Um, and the preservation paving uh, that keeps the roads um, the way they need to be. It's a lot cheaper to keep up a road than it is to rebuild it. Um, it also includes substantial investments in other in other modes, including two. This is both for capital and operating: two hundred thirty-five million uh, for transit, two hundred twenty for aviation. Uh, this all totals the highway side is all types totals about. 70% of the work plan at 3.3 billion, 
uh, the transit side is about 1.1 billion um, overall, a 24% of our work plan. Um, so every single one, active transportation, bike ped, transit, aviation, uh, ports and marine, uh, the ferry service, and keeping the Amtrak down Easter operations running. And uh, so that's, it's just, it's just really good news. And uh, I appreciated the comments from Laura, um, Chant Workforce. So this is a shift from, I say, making due to making real progress. Uh, I feel pol policymakers delivered at both the federal and state level. So now the focus here is on us delivering, working with our construction partners. And a big part of that is gonna be workforce. Uh, that's a, going to be an ongoing challenge, but uh, I think there, I, it feels like a corner has turned there. I know that AGC is working hard on this, uh, and so I'm, I'm feeling positive. Um, it's not easy, but it's never going to be. Transportation is a big job in Maine. It's always going to be with a least densely developed state east of the Mississippi. Um, 1.38 million people spread over 35,000 square miles. That's just a lot of bridges and railroads and, and highways and uh, other transportation infrastructure to take care of. So, um, but that's the job. That's the greatest job I'll ever love. So uh, um, we're kind of on offense. Uh, it feels invigorating, uplifting. Let's go, giddy up. Let's build some stuff. Um, we're still going to have future funding discussions, but for the first time in my career, we actually have some dedicated capital funding for transportation, which is key and important because that leverages, you know, about every dollar leverages about $3 of federal funds. So um, good news on the transportation front. Uh, we'd look forward to uh, producing and this work plan is available online. You can sort it by town. Everybody can get right down as what, what's going on in your town by mode. And uh, it was there just to answer the basic question. Um, that's a lot of money. What do you do with it? So we just lay it all out so everyone can see it. So uh, that's the end of my time, I, I think, uh, Patrick. So um, thanks for the opportunity. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I, I think Maine doesn't have the luxury to be complacent with a lot of things, but but Department of Transportation is one where you need constantly um, to look at costs, uh, the bridges, and having the right people in place and leadership. And and we're so pleased of uh, the assessment you're providing that uh, that tale of woe hopefully will be altered uh, in your cover letter today with a more to reflect your comments today, it, it is encouraging to hear of the legislative support and in these infrastructure investments. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, next, we're going to turn to uh, Commissioner Lambrew uh, with the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, Commissioner Lambrew uh, has extensive federal policy experience, also academic experience, grew up in Maine, um, uh, worked as uh, um, one of the policy advisors in the Obama administration and has been leading uh, DHHS for now um, uh, not about, is it six years? So thank you, Commissioner. Five years. Five. Not that I'm counting. <laughs> Five thank you, Commissioner. hard years, because these are hard jobs, <laughs> as I think most people will tell you. Uh, thanks, Dick, for, and for including me. It's nice to see all of you. Um, Happy New Year. I'll be relatively brief about what's going on in the Maine Department of Health and Human Services this year in this short session. There are two words that categorize our work. One is reform and the other is response. On the reform side, I think many of you may know that we passed unanimously in the legislature a few years ago, a Maine Care rate reform framework to try to bring how Medicaid or Maine Care in Maine pays for services into the 21st century, promote value, try to get payment rates that meet the needs and promote the outcomes that we want in our healthcare system. 
I'm proud to say since that law was passed, we have done over 50% of our various services in terms of going through them, updating how we pay and making improvements in those. But on the horizon are two big ones. We have hospital rate reform on the horizon, as well as nursing facility rate reform on the horizon. Those will be major areas of focus and they matter because when it, we look at our economy, a big fraction of our GDP is healthcare. Uh, healthcare sector in the state of Maine is the, I think, largest employer. And we do know that to attract businesses, to attract workers, we need to have a strong, quality, affordable healthcare system. So we're excited about that work and we'll say Medicaid is an important player in this because when I arrived five years ago, it was almost five years ago to date that the governor signed her first executive order to expand Maine Care um, under the Affordable Care Act's option. We've gone from about 300,000 people to 400,000 people in the program and that's not really going down. So it is a major payer of healthcare in Maine and we look forward to continuing to do our part. Second major set of reforms has to do with affordable housing. You know, during the pandemic and in its aftermath, our general assistance program here at the department skyrocketed uh, the expenditures in that program, tripled in part because people were losing affordable housing, going to hotels, going to shelters. We committed to doing a reform of that general assistance program last year, spent the spring and summer doing listening sessions, have ideas that we presented to the legislature this fall and are going to try to move that program back to a program of last resort as we begin to also phase out emergency housing, transitional housing spending at Maine State Housing Association and move towards affordable housing because the other big project in reform for us this year is the beginning of implementation of Housing First. How do we really early on identify people who have significant needs and get them into housing with supportive services so they are not um, not getting services on in different areas of our state. So we're excited about that work. And then the third area of reform is in child services. Uh, I just announced that we have made some major changes at the Office of Child and Family Services. We announced a new permanent director, Bobby Johnson, who has done this work as a child welfare caseworker at the start of her career, all the way up through the department. She will be our new permanent director. She will lead a management audit of child welfare. So we are really making sure that we manage that team of people who do some of our most difficult work in the state of working with families in distress. She will lead that effort. And then we also will be moving and realigning some of our services. Children's Behavioral Health is actually in the Office of Child and Family Services and we will be moving that to the Office of Behavioral Health so we can begin to align those services because I think we all know that our children and youth during the pandemic and afterwards have really had increased anxiety, have ex increased experience, incre experienced increased depression and need additional supports. So with that movement, we can have a better management alignment. We can have better services alignments as youth age into adulthood. And I think strengthen the continuum of services in mental health and behavioral health which is my segue to response. Uh, we all, I think, have um, you know, been challenged by what happened in Lewiston with the mass shooting, its aftermath, which is not over. We all know from these experiences in different states, in different areas, that the recovery from something so devastating takes lots of time. So our department continues this work in mental health with the Lewiston community, the Maine Resiliency Center, the deaf and hard of hearing community that was particularly hard hit in Maine and our partners in the Department of Education because we know kids are always particularly affected when something so shocking and horrible happens. So that work continues this year, as does something that probably is on a lot of people's mind is response to these dramatic weather events. You know, we all were scrambling too much. So I think in my department after the December 18th storm to make sure our drinking water was clean, and that people who lost power for extended days had replacement food. And that's the sort of changes that we need to be able to be quick and adapted to. So my department this year will also focus on how we improve our response to these changing weather patterns that um, are really, you know, truly challenges for our businesses, our economy, and our people. So 
between the reforms that we have on the horizon and our, our response efforts, we'll be busy this year. But thank you very much for having me and I look forward to hearing uh, from my other commissioners. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Commissioner. We are, um, I, I think you're you're noting the, the scale of, of um, ensuring that there's a healthy population in Maine and we do not have a healthy business community if we don't have a healthy population and uh, the scale of, of the challenges coming out of uh, the pandemic, Lewiston and the drug epidemic are, are, are certainly uh, poignant. Um, did want to turn uh, now to Commissioner Camuso with the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Commissioner. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for inviting me here. It's wonderful to be here and to hear from all the other commissioners about all the great work that we are doing together. Um, I'm really lucky in being Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife. I've worked for the agency for almost 20 years. Um, I started my career here as a wildlife biologist uh, in Southern Maine and then uh, as wildlife director before I became Commissioner. And I'm really fortunate to work with an amazing group of talented, brilliant, passionate, and dedicated staff. Um, in, in addition to that, the folks that we engage with are by and large doing things that they love, uh, whether they're hunting, fishing, birding, boating, ATVing. The people we engage with are outside and uh, they're, they're generally happy. Um, and I think that makes our agency a little, a little different. Um, as you all know, Maine is a destination for Mainers and Visitors alike, our outdoor recreation economy represents nearly 4% of Maine's GDP, supports more than 30,000 jobs in Maine and about 4.9% of the employment, providing more than $1.2 billion in compensation. Um, and employment in this sector has grown 15.6% in Maine compared to 13.1% uh, in the rest of the United States. There are only five other states in the country that have larger outdoor economies than Maine does. Uh, and the good news is that our economy, our outdoor economy, continues to grow, expanding by over 16% between 2021 and 2022. Now, you may have heard that hunting is a dwindling activity, uh, a relic of the past, declining numbers, and that may be the case in other states, uh, but it's not the case here in Maine. We have some of the highest hunting numbers, hunting license sales uh, since 1982. That's nearly 40 years. We've seen tremendous growth, uh, particularly in the past several years with sales increasing over 10% in just the past 10 years and back-to-back -back increases in the past three years. Similarly, uh, fishing in Maine continues to grow. We have more licensed anglers in the state than we have ever had. And why not? I mean, we've got 6,000 lakes and ponds, 32,000 miles of streams and rivers, and we have over 370,000 licensed anglers in the state, which is a 20% increase in the last 10 years. It's really important to note that these license fees for hunting and fishing licenses provide the departments uh, with a substantial portion of our budget. So this growth is, of course, really important to us. Mainers and visitors alike continue to enjoy the outdoors in unprecedented numbers, reflecting the passion that people have for the Maine outdoors. And we all know here at the agency uh, that being outside is restorative, it's healthy, it's fulfilling. And I strive as commissioner to make it easier to get folks outside. When we are working to break down barriers and make it easier to get people in the outdoors, the number of women in, have grown in the outdoors has grown um, with the number of women purchasing hunting licenses growing by 17% over the past five years. We continue to reach new audiences, providing opportunities, and this is my personal passion. I believe that people will protect what they love, and so I want to get more people passionate and engaged in outdoor activities, um, assuming that they will then work to protect those activities. 
This past summer, we worked with Commissioner Liberty and hosted an all women's outdoor skill seminar at the Southern Maine Women's Reentry Re Center in Wyndham. And that day was designed to teach outdoor skills to women in that center, providing them with the skills they can use once they are uh, outside. This February 17th, I'm really pleased to share that we will be hosting our first ever, and we think the first in the nation, Pride Outside Day. Um, this will be a day focused on LBGDQ plus at Range State Park, Rain State Park in Poland. Um, the event is open to folks of all identities, abilities, and experience levels. And it will focus on showcasing outdoor activities, winter outdoor activities in particular, uh, such as ice fishing, snowshoeing, wildlife tracking, snowmobiling, and a whole lot more. Um, we are in, as you know, the second session for our legislative. Uh, with our legislative committee. We had over 75 bills last year that we addressed. Um, this session, we only have a few new bills, but are wrapping up uh, a lot of the bills that were carried over from last year. And um, just a few highlights there. Um, we worked with our committee last week and presented some information on how the department's changing our educational approach with municipalities um, to clarify some confusion around hunting and fishing matters and authorities where the towns and municipal municipalities have certain authorities and where the state's authority is. Um, yesterday, we met with the legislature and gave our report back on the recreational vehicle tax allocations and how it's impacting boating, snowmobiling, and ATVing. And looking ahead, we'll be reporting back to the legislature on issues around moose hunting, such as season length. Um, timing permits um, and that sort of thing. As I stated earlier, uh, Maine is a destination state and several of our report backs at the legislature are focusing on ensuring that we are continuing to protect the resources, including a study on the impact of weight boats on shoreline property and the environment and several bills regarding uh, funding for the prevention and control of aquatic invasive species. So we are also working diligently on the state's main won't wait uh, action plan where we have a goal to conserve over 30% of land by 2030. Over the past four years, the department has conserved over 20,000 acres, not only conserving areas for people to enjoy and recreate on, but areas that will also sequester carbon and help mitigate the impacts of climate change. This year, we're on track to secure another 12,000 acres protecting core fisheries and wildlife habitats that will ensure not only our children, but our grandchildren will have a chance to see moose in the wild or uh, land our trophy trout. So I can see I have less than a minute left. So um, I will just wrap up and say, you know, some of the things that are really pertinent right now, as a few people have talked about um, with the past few storms, we've seen a real danger to some of our recreational trail infrastructure. And so we will be working with the governor's office uh, and folks to try and come up with a way to ensure that those trails uh, remain viable in the long run. And um, I think I will um, end it there and um, happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you. Well, thank you, Commissioner. What an exciting time to be leading the department with so much interest in hunting, fishing, and getting outdoors. I'll have to pick your brain about moving forward with my two daughters uh, from mackerel fishing to more exciting activities in the, in the great Maine outdoors. Thank you so much for your leadership. Uh, lastly, I wanted to turn to Commissioner Beal with the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. Commissioner Beal. Great, thank you so much. Um, and thanks for, for having us all here today. It's really a pleasure always to hear about what other um, commissioners are, are working on, um, as it's been said already, there's a lot of collaboration within this administration and with organizations like yours and others all across the state. So um, I know a lot of these uh, issues are very complex and interconnected, so you might hear similar themes in some of what I talk about uh, in the next few minutes as well. Um, and I do want to just say my computer has decided uh, recently that it would like to um, restart. <laughs> so I keep telling it not to, and hopefully it won't force it while I'm uh, speaking here for the next few minutes. But um, just as an overview, for those of you who might not be as familiar with the inner workings of the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry, 
as a natural resource agency, our charge is really quite broad. We have four bureaus, 110 programs and approximately 700 staff members. Um, so I'm just gonna say a little bit about each of our bureaus just to give you kind of that bird's eye view. And then I'll touch on just a very few uh, number of areas that we're working on that I think might be of interest to all of you. Um, but obviously I could, I could talk for a long time today, but I don't have a long time. So um, in our first bureau, the Bureau of Agriculture, Food and Rural Resources, uh, we work on everything from engaging broader food system issues like food insecurity, supply chain res resilience, um, conservation and farmland access to supporting farmers uh, with marketing and promotional efforts like through our Real Main program. Uh, and we also organize or promote or participate in a whole host of events that highlight all of the great agricultural products that we grow and raise here in the state. And, and these um, promotional, uh, you know, activities are often a real source of income generation for our farms and food producers, producers as well. So in fact, I'll remind people, I know it might seem like it's a long ways off, but it's really coming right up. Um, there's an event that kind of kicks off the promotional uh, event season for agriculture, and that's the Maine Maple Producers Maine Maple Sunday, which will be March 23rd and 24th. Um, and there are always lots of great uh, places you can visit and learn about maple production and support our farmers uh, in the process. In our Bureau of Forestry, we house the main forest service and the many layers of technical expertise those staff bring to managing and protecting our forest resources each day, from tracking invasive pests and diseases impacting our forests to working with individual woodland owners to help them understand how to be good stewards of their own forests, uh, in fighting forest fires and promoting the many ways forest products and the hardworking people who bring them to us are important to and enhance our everyday lives. So that's just a snapshot of the good work of our main forest service. Our Bureau of Parks and Lands oversees about 700,000 acres of public lands, including 48 historic sites and state parks, all managed and cared for by our incredibly dedicated staff. Um, we also provide support to recreational groups across the street states such as snowmobile clubs um, and to municipalities in support of rec uh, recreational opportunities that enhance our state and our economy in various ways. And then we have our fourth bureau, uh, the Bureau of Land Use Planning and Resource Information, which contains a wealth of programs and experts that are working in the fields of geology, ecology, land use planning, uh, and just so much more. So you've heard a number of us talk already about climate resilience. This is really um, a, a very primary focal point of our work. Um, it's clear to us that climate change impacts everything we are responsible for as a department and all we do. And we also know that it's having a significant impact on our natural resource-based businesses and their ability to plan and perform activities. We're timing around what were once lar largely predictable seasonal patterns has been increasingly challenged and hard to predict. Um, so part of that work is just making sure we have the tools we need to respond to these challenges or that we can provide tools that build resilience and reduce vulnerability to others. So, for example, over the past few years, we've been working to upgrade our uh, main forest service aerial fleet, um, which is really integral in our ability to combat forest fires and protect forest resources. Um, but they do so much more as well. For example, we've talked about these recent storms and the impact they've had on our state and our Forest Service, um, you know, fleet has been, aerial fleet has been really instrumental in helping to get up in the air and uh, assess some of the statewide damage and really help us get our arms around um, the, the breadth of the impact. On the agricultural front, we are busy standing up a healthy soils program that will work with farmers to implement um, voluntary uh, strategies and, and practices to really improve soil health and, um, and build climate resilience and, and resilience in the face of increasing extreme weather events and other challenges that come with climate change for our farmers. Um, we're also working to stand up a drought irrigation fund. Um, last year was a really wet year. The year before you could have drawn a line right through the state Half of our state was in drought for a good period of time and the other half was fine. 
hard to predict. And so we need to make sure that people have a way to control irrigation and make sure they have water when they need it, where they need it. Um, and then on a broader scale, we have numerous staff that have been very deeply involved in supporting the development of our state's climate action plan, both the plan that was released in 2020 and now as we work to update it to reflect priorities for the coming four years. Um, one other significant body of work, which I'm sure you've heard about, is our work uh, responding to the impacts of PFAS contamination on farmland. Um, we continue to work really closely with, D with DEP to identify impacted businesses. We have learned a great deal about how to best support farmers in identifying ways to shift management practices, to minimize or avoid sources of contamination, and to find a viable pathway forward for their business. And I know this is an issue that's gotten a lot of press, but I always like to give people some perspective. Very few of our 7,000 or so farms in Maine will ultimately be directly impacted by PFAS contamination. But for those who are, we know how devastating it can be for them, their families and their communities. So we will be keeping this work front and center. We've also been working to stand up a suite of programs to provide any needed ongoing support through the PFAS Fund Program, which has been allocated $60 million by the legislature and just recently an additional $5 million through the USDA as they recognize the benefit of our work in this area in helping to inform what will take shape as what I see will become a much more robust national response in the coming years. So it's been a really tough issue to navigate um, especially being out ahead of it, um, you know, and, and out ahead of the nation. Um, but we really are ahead of the curve now, and I'm really just incredibly proud of the work our staff has done alongside farmers on this front and appreciate the excellent collaboration that has occurred between our department, DEP, and Maine CDC within DHHS that has gotten us to this point. Um, really quickly, we're also excited through the Maine Jobs and Recovery Plan. We have been um, working to make $15 million in investments, infrastructure investments in our state parks um, to make sure that they're going to be enjoyable for many generations to come. Um, happy to talk more about that. We've done a number of ADA access projects. Um, we've improved entrances, roads, and other critical infrastructure. Um, we've also invested with MJRP funds uh, nearly $20 million in agricultural infrastructure. Um, and we are getting ready to uh, do another round of investment with nearly $3.5 million in federal funds. Um, so stay tuned on that front. And then finally, I'll just say that we've also been very excited about the work we've been able to do with land for, through Land for Maine's Future. As you might know, in 2021, we were uh, allocated $40 million through the general fund for the LMF program. And then since then, our staff and the LMF board have been hard at work identifying and funding really excellent projects across the state um, with an investment of $22.7 million to date. Uh, we have approved 56 projects and we're expected to leverage an additional $52.6 million in private and federal funds to protect over 64,000 acres. So with that, um, thank you so much for uh, your time and I will turn the mic back over because I'm sure I'm out of time. Commissioner, thank you so much. I, I, I think it's a, another area that has been a bright spot for the main economy, but has these um, current challenges uh, from PFAS and, and drought and climate change that um, challenges the kind of long term trajectory and appreciate all that you're doing on behalf of, of the agricultural community, but also in the conservation efforts to uh, promote uh, livable and accessible access for for all Mainers. Um, we we really have have uh, gone to the point where we're really out of time. I did want to ask if there are any burning questions from anyone, if if people could raise their hand. Uh, but uh, did want to be mindful of commissioners' schedules as well. Um, but I'll give one moment to see if there's any burning questions. But if not, I will I will just thank the commissioners. It, it's clear that we are uh, we're incredibly grateful for the leadership that they bring um, every day. It is in many ways a thankless task. Um, and we're really appreciative of the people with the experience they have 
step into these positions. So with that, I, I think I'll thank everybody for participating. It was a full roster, roster of commissioners. And uh, thank you again for those uh, participating and our sponsors today.